start a recording so that I can put this onto uh, YouTube later. But just again, very briefly, what I'm going to be talking about today, written materials in traditional scripts, orthography and literacy development, British era publications and manuscripts, and video and audio recordings made by community members. Okay, so let's start with written materials produced in traditional scripts. Now there's quite a few traditional scripts that are in use in Northeast India and more widely. And today I'll only speak about the Thai scripts because they're the ones that I have some expertise in. So already we have an existing archive of Daya Home manuscripts and I've given you the um, link there at the Endangered Archive Program of the British Library. Around 20,000 pages amounting to 500 manuscripts. These can be downloaded and looked at online and studied by people who want to study the Daya Home. But there's a lot more than that. Significant gaps in the archive from the perspective of Thai languages would relate to manuscripts in Thai Pake, Thai Aiton, Thai Kam Yang, Thai Kam Ti, the Thai manuscripts in the Trung villages, the Thai Trung villages. Many of these have been written down in the last couple of hundred years, some of them more recently, some of them older, some of them are in private hands, some of them are in temple libraries. They look a little like this. So what we see here is a photograph of a manuscript that belongs to um, the Jautere or the Patek of a Borhula village, Nikang. I photographed this probably 15 years ago. I haven't been to Borhula, Borhula village for a long time. But as you can see from that photograph, the manuscript is on handmade paper. The paper is beginning to be a little brittle on both sides and the manuscript is an important one to record relating to the type of writing that was used in these communities and also the the meaning of it but simply taking photographs isn't enough because a photograph won't tell us what it means which is why i'd like to see projects to not just take photographs of these manuscripts but also record the owners of them and the people who understand the meaning of these, speaking them, telling them, reading them out loud, which is the traditional way to read these manuscripts, and also explaining its meaning. Now, there's a lot of work to be done there, but if we don't do this work, we're going to lose a lot of knowledge of these old manuscripts. And there are thousands and thousands of manuscripts like this that are in um, libraries, temple libraries, and in private hands in different Thai communities in Northeast India. And all those other communities that have traditional writing systems will have materials like this. So we need to photograph the manuscripts, certainly, at least at the quality that this one is photographed, but also to, and this is a much bigger task, to get some understanding of the meaning of these texts before that is lost, which it is in danger of being done. So the second point that I wanted to talk about was this traditional, uh, this, sorry, were this newly created um, community led work on literacy development and development of writing systems. So we could start, for example, by talking, and I'm going to just in this short lecture, mention some from the Tangsa community, or Tangshang as it would be called on the Burma, Myanmar side. Um, efforts since probably the 1970s to produce written information in languages that did not have a writing system at the time. I've talked in the past about the work of Lakum Mosang in producing his script, and he passed away in July, just two months back. And while there is certainly work being done to develop his script and to teach it, we should also document all of those uh, manuscripts and other things that he produced in his script so that we do not lose the history of that. But 
that was a um, newly created script, but there are many communities that have worked on making writing in the Roman script. And here's one example. This is a primer in the Ngaimong Tangsa language made probably in the 1970s. This is a copy of a book that is held in Lakla village uh, near Jagun in Upper Assam. You can see some of the difficulties we have for preserving these kinds of materials. So I'm taking photograph of this outside. Uh, you can see the stones on the ground. I've put it on top of a plastic um, seat, which is flat, so that I can take a nice photo so that we can see everything. And, you know, if you uh, try and look more closely, you can uh, read the words. The story on the right hand side is about uh, the Kelkai, which is a goat. Um, this is probably the oldest written book in any Tangsa language that I know of at this point, uh, which has been done as a, as a teaching material, as a teaching way. And it's a, it's a brittle document. You can see it's already torn a little bit. The bottom of the left-hand side, it's made on very light 20th century paper. So we need to, documents like this will be held in many households and we need to get them photographed at least nicely so that they can be archived. Another example um, is a book written by Baike Mungre, um, I think on the Burma side. Um, and this is about various stories of the culture, about different events that happen in different months in the tradition. But the thing about this one is, so it was photographed by me as best I could, but it was photographed a little bit on the side, so it's not exactly straight. And <clears throat> would have been better if one had a scanner to scan it nicely. But still, all the information is there. Probably about 20 years old, this document, something like that. But this particular writing system isn't in use anymore. So someone, at some point, we need to have an, ex an explanation of how this writing system relates to the current system, which is known as the Tangshang Naga Unified Orthography, or TNUO, that is being used in Myanmar for the Mungre variety, how that relates to this document. Now, possibly, of even more interest for many people in the Northeast is the British era publications and manuscripts. Now, some of these are very well preserved and available in online sources, but these are not always available free to community members. So, for example, the Royal Asiatic Society of Bengal, which was a news, uh, a journal that was put out, I think going back to the 18th century, um, published many articles by British era people about smaller languages. The ones that I'm most familiar with are the ones by William Robinson in 1849, where he talked, he talked about Thai languages, whether it was Kamti or Pake, it's not completely clear, possibly a form of Thai Kamti. He talked about a Singpo, he talked about uh, varieties of Nokte, including the Namsang variety of Nokte, and various other languages. And these documents are available, but I can access some of these because my university library pays a fee to whichever organisation has put these up online, and I'm therefore able to get them free. But that isn't the case for everyone. But then there are publications and certainly some manuscripts that are now in the hands of collectors, and at this point, unavailable to scholars. So one of these examples is the papers of Edmund Rich, who was uh, an, an employee of the government of Burma, the British government of Burma in the 1920s, and made expeditions up into the Naga Hills. And his papers were sold for a very large amount of money that I couldn't afford to buy them and they went into the hands of a collector, but I was able to see them. They came briefly to Melbourne in, I think, 2014, and I transcribed as much as I could. And here on the right-hand side is a part of a transcription of 
a small part of what I read. So, and you can see I've made some spelling mistakes as I go. So the Rangpang Naga of this report, but I've typed the wrong thing, west of the Hukong Valley and south of the Batgai Range divide, there are several kells of Rangpangs, Mosang, Shangwan, Morang, Shangke, Mimu, that's Ngaimong, Langxing, Yanong Kaisan, that would be Kaisan, Jamkok, Tampan, etc., etc. Seven, eight, and nine are said to be continually at war with the others, etc., etc., etc. Now, this information is important for us to keep, to have access to, but at the moment we don't, because this document, I copied as much of it as I could in the time I had access, but it has gone into a private collection somewhere, and I don't know where. Um, later, in the same typed document that I was transcribing, um, there was some information about the Bisa chief, chief, and you'll see that, again, with my uh, spelling mistakes, this probably should read Bisa Lidai. Now, I don't think that's the right name, but, um, you know, perhaps that is a, that's either a misprint by me or by the original writer, is an intelligent simple who lives near Lido, Lido, spoke about three villages, um, three villages, two Singpo and one Kampi village in which three slaves were found by rich. Um, so there's interesting and important information in these documents. Um, <clears throat> we can go to the British Library and find information. And I went into the British Library manuscript section, and I think there's a lot more work that needs to be done on this. Um, but this is an openly and publicly available document. And when you search for Naga, you get a number of entries. Now, the first few I don't think are relevant to what we are talking about because the word Naga means multiple things. But later on, I found um, a, a reference that was of interest. So this is from 1847 says, Proceedings Relating to Assam, Naga and Garo Tribes. So, papers on the expedition to the Angami Hills by Captain John Butler. There's around 37 pages, or I think 38 pages of this, and I haven't looked through it yet, but they are actually scanned and can be downloaded. Um, there's a letter from Major Jenkins um, about his visit, about the visit to the Angami Hills of Captain Butler in 1847. Um, there's letters about observations relating to the Angami Hills. So there's a lot of documents like this in public libraries. Probably the most um, uh, valuable reference will be the British Library. Um, as part of preparing for today's talk, I found online a um, an article that was published 20 years ago by the late Gordon Means, who was a professor in Canada, I think. And he was writing about um, human sacrifice and slavery in the unadministered areas of Upper Burma. So again, this relates largely to the uh, Tangshan groups. Um, <coughs> and this is the... Um, what we call the abstract for his article, saying that before 1930, large parts of Upper Burma, which actually also included across the border into India, parts of what would now be Nagaland or Longding District, Tirap District and Chongmang District that were unadministered. And many societies in these areas practiced, hum uh, practiced slavery and some also performed human sacrifice. So, Britain was pressured to abolish slavery and human sacrifice throughout Burma after the formation of the League of Nations Slavery Commission, which would have been in the late 1919 or early 1920. And so they sent these expeditions into the villages. Um, and over a period of about six years, between around 1922 and 1928, um, it is said that all of these uh, slaves were liberated and um, 
human sacrifice was abolished. Now, what's of interest to us is that these documents contain a great deal of background information that were impressions by the British officials at the time about what was going on in those villages. So <clears throat> now the Jaime Naga village of Seranok, I should have done some preliminary research to check which community was there. Um, but this relates to one of the Tangsa or Tangshan communities. Um, <clears throat> and this is a story that the headman spoke to Dua, who was um, another, important another important government official in Burma at the time, and who wrote a great deal of information about all the communities that he came across. Um, <clears throat> and we can see um, what he says. So he says, formerly the Kachins and the Nagas were living Majoi Shingrabum, and together came down to the southern mountains. So this is, a, this is part of the creation story. The Kachins, or Jingpo, or Singpo, as we would call, um, on the India side, were able to cultivate sufficient paddy and yams for their requirements. The Nagas were not so successful and consulted the Matumata nut. Now, Matumata is certainly a figure that I used to hear a lot about when I was recording stories in the Singapore speaking areas <clears throat> around Margarita and Bordumsa and that area. Um, and so even though this relates to Tangsa speaking tribes, there's actually examples of um, Singpo or Jingpo language that is being used here. So you can, you can read the story that he tells, but you can also see that this kind of information should be available to people who are studying the stories of the past in our area. And here are some references. Now, I only came to be aware of this document earlier in the week, but you'll see there's a great many references. And some of these are to India office files. Now, the person who wrote this article would have had copies of all of these, I presume, but he passed away 10 years ago. So I can't ask him for them. And one of the things that I am going to be needing to do in the coming years or, and months, um, and perhaps others can also help with this, is to find out where these documents are. So if we look at T.P. Dewar's reports, of an expedition to the Hukong Valley and Naga Hills, December 1926 to 1927, and then the report on the Naga Hills expedition for the abolition of human sacrifice season 1926 to 1927. Both of these documents will have a lot of important and interesting historical information in them. And we need to be able to find those. So there's still a great deal of research needing to be done. So I've mentioned already three things that I think are priorities for future work, and I'm not sure how much of it I personally can do. So one of them is photographing and recording those traditional Thai manuscripts and indeed manuscripts of other communities. But in the case of the Thai ones, not just photographing them, but also finding out what they mean. So having someone speak them and explain them. And the second was, all those efforts that have been done over the last 50 years to bring these languages into writing, we should record, we should, we should preserve all of that information, photograph it and archive it. And the third is searching the existing archives for finding information from the British time. And if we can even find the information that's in private collections, we should do it. But finally, there are video and audio recordings made by community members. And some of the mo most valuable of these are ones that will have been done 20 or 30 years ago from people who are no longer alive. And these may contain really important information about traditions, about songs, about stories that are no longer told or songs that are no longer sung. And if they still exist somewhere, then we should find them and copy them onto a modern format and put them into an archive. So as what needs to be done for these um, materials is firstly to find them and then to copy them 
into a modern format. So for example, there was a cassette recording of something, and I'll talk about an example of that shortly. We want to turn that into a digitized form, but then, and also collect whatever information we can about it, the metadata, the who, who sang it, who, who told it, where they did it, when they did it, what is it about, and the how, what, how was it recorded, if this information is known. And then once it's digitized and the metadata is prepared, it can be archived. So I'm going to finish off today's brief discussion about these issues with a, an, um, a mention of a cassette that is not very good quality, that was made in about 1980 by the late Gyeongla, the Gombura, I put in brackets village headman, but everyone listening to this will know what a Gombura is, of Gumchaikong Singpo village in Assam. I used to stay in his house. He was born, I think, in about 1916, and he passed away mm, around about uh, 10 years ago. He's a very old man, very skilled um, expert. He he sang a number of songs, but one song that he didn't know was this song, which is a um, Kat Yong Minkin, apparently. Now, um, the singer on the cassette was the late, um, sorry, I just have to make sure that I've shared the computer sound. The singer on the cassette was the late Gja Nong Bu of Nampai, and the song is accompanied by the doro, the traditional fiddle. You'll hear that in a minute. But the words can't be made out. So I played this recording to a number of the older people in the Singapore community, and they couldn't tell me what he was actually singing about. You'll hear why in a moment. But according to the Mpangum guy, uh, one of the elderly ladies of the Singapore community, still living at um, um, in Tem village, which is in Assam, um, close to the Dihing River, <coughs> uh, heading towards Bordumsa, but not quite there. Um, it would have been sung at a wedding. So have a listen to this and you'll see that the quality is not very high, but it is still a very important document. Okay, so as far as we know today, there's no one singing songs exactly like this. But if there are, they're not being recorded in a way that I'm aware of. And I have never met anybody who plays the fiddle in that way while singing. So this is an important um, video to have and to keep preserved and an example of one more thing that there needs to be further research on. Okay, so I'm going to um, finish at this point, I'm going to stop the um, video and I will put this up on YouTube later. But if anybody has any comments or wants to say anything, then um, say so through the Facebook. I'll be there in a second.